and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. The pandemic continues around the world and aging continues to take its toll, but rejuvenation research continues as well. So let's dive right in. We are welcoming a new writer to the Lifespan.io team. Dr. Greg Gillespie is a recent graduate of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and he continues to conduct laboratory research in stem cell regeneration and cellular senescence. You can check out his first article, which explores how senescence and senolytics were discussed at our recent Ending Age-Related Diseases conference on our website at lifespan.io. Speaking of our conference, many more videos from the event have now been made available. These include a talk from Dr. Brian Kennedy on preventative medicine, a panel discussion on the public perception of longevity, Sergey Young on why rejuvenation is a trillion-dollar opportunity, and interviews with David Wood and Daria Kalterina. On the subject of video, multiple episodes of Lifespan News have also been released. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can see all of this content when it's released. To give you an idea of what you might be missing, here's the audio of one of these recent episodes. Welcome to Lifespan News, your source for longevity science updates. I'm your host, Brent Nally. For our first story, a team led by Dr. Brian Kennedy from Singapore University has shown that administering alpha-ketoglutarate to mice has increased lifespan and health span. Lifespan increases were modest, 10% for females and 5% for males. However, the effect on health span was much more significant. Control mice became much more frail more quickly than mice treated with AKG. During the last 5% of their lifespan, untreated female mice were on average a lot more frail than treated ones under the same conditions. The treated mice also experienced less hair loss and discoloration that is often observed during aging. Overall, the researchers found that at least in mice, administering AKG results in a suppression of chronic age-related inflammation and compression of morbidity. So in other words, there was a reduction in the time spent in age-related ill health without significant lifespan extension. For our next story, a group of researchers has proposed three transplantation techniques for fighting microglial-related conditions such as Alzheimer's. These three techniques could also potentially boost cognitive abilities. Microglial cells form the backbone of our brain's immune system. Microglial dysfunction is thought to be an important factor behind the bulk of age-related neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and frontal temporal dementia result at least partially from microglial failing in their centennial and housekeeping duties. The trick is to deplete microglial cells to make room for the transplant. The scientists treated mice with a compound that kills microglial cells. When the new cells were introduced soon after, they successfully proliferated, taking the place of the disease resident microglia. The three techniques have different strengths and weaknesses. There also needs to be more work to test the long-term effect of obliterating the microglia population before the transplant. To summarize, this work helps point the way towards techniques that could possibly help alleviate age-related neurodegenerative diseases. Moving on, researchers looked at DNA methylation across a 10-year time span in twin studies in Denmark and Sweden. They found that genetic contribution to methylation, that is, how much methylation was inherited versus acquired, was generally small and decreased over the 10-year period. However, methylation at aging-related sites was more heritable than other sites. Immune or inflammation genes were overrepresented in the approximately 5,000 sites with the greatest heritability. They conclude that, quote, elevated genetic contributions at age-related methylation sites suggest that adaptations to aging and senescence may be differentially impacted by genetic background, end quote. For our next story, researchers have found that centenarians do not carry fewer pathogenic mutations. The study looked at disease-associated mutations in centenarians in a population of Ashkenazi Jews. 
They compared centenarians, their offspring, and control individuals. There was no difference in the burden of pathogenic variants within the three groups. The researchers conclude that this supports the idea that the extended lifespan and health span of centenarians is not because they have fewer pathogenic mutations, but, quote, rather a result of other genomic, epigenomic, or potentially non-genomic properties, end quote. For our final story, an open access paper co-authored by Dr. Vadim Gladyshev reviews the current understanding of the aging process. The paper shares an integrative model in which damage drives aging. The paper also proposes a, quote, stemness function model, end quote, where aging might be the result of a transition from a, quote, pro-stemness, end quote, state, in which cells are more focused on proliferation and damage dilution, to a, quote, pro-function, end quote, state, in which cells focus more on enhancing their specific function at the expense of damage dilution, leading to damage accumulation. Finally, the paper proposes possible approaches to rejuvenation within the stemness function model. Lifespan News isn't the only series you'll find on our YouTube channel. You'll also find new episodes of Science to Save the World. Here's a recent episode exploring the causes and results of the forest fires that have recently plagued Oregon and California. Apocalyptic orange skies over parts of California serve as a stark reminder of climate change causing increased wildfire activity. Wildfires have been getting worse in the last three decades, and even more so in the last five years. In less than a month, the August Complex fire became California's largest wildfire ever recorded, burning over 875,000 acres. As of this recording, it's still not contained. The third and fourth largest fires ever recorded also started at about the same time. That's three of the four largest fires ever, all in one month. Why have these fires been getting worse, and what can we do about them? Let's back up a bit. How do these fires actually begin? Fires need a combination of three essential ingredients, oxygen, fuel, and heat. Oxygen is the obvious one, and can be further added by winds. Fuel comes mostly in the form of dead and living vegetation, and anything else that can burn. Dry brush and leaves are a prime wildfire fuel source. Heat can come from natural sources, such as lightning or the sun, or from human sources, such as campfires, power lines, fireworks, arson, or even a cigarette. It is estimated that humans cause 80 to 90% of all wildfires. These conditions have all been made more ripe in recent decades by climate change and increased warming. Hotter weather provides more of the third ingredient, heat, and produces less rain, creating more dry fuel to burn. Therefore, mitigating climate change is essential to combating wildfires. Wildfires have also increased in recent years due to fire suppression and land management policies. Although well-intentioned, these may have been misguided. Fires can actually be a beneficial natural phenomenon, clearing away dead vegetation, and they occurred for millions of years before humans arrived on the scene. In fact, some conifers have actually evolved to use fires to help them reproduce. Lodgepole pines produce a type of cone that bursts open at high levels of heat, like that caused by fire, releasing millions of seeds. These seeds are carried by hot air to less dense areas of the forest, where they have a greater chance of germinating and growing and ash provides good fertilizer. Ancient indigenous peoples learned to live with naturally occurring fires, and even created intentional burns to manage dry vegetation. Much of this traditional knowledge was lost due to fire suppression policies adopted in the last 150 years. In 1910, after the massive Big Burn Fire, US governments began actively combating forest fires, eventually fighting around 95% of all wildfires that arose. As a result, Forests became overgrown and dense, storing more fuel for fires to grow much larger and faster. Essentially, some became ticking time bombs just waiting for a spark. We're slowly reintroducing controlled burn policies that mimic nature's fires, but more needs to be done. Not only do prescribed fires carefully burn the overgrown vegetation, they also rid forests of diseased trees and damaging insects, and they increase diversity. Grazing animals can also help reduce overgrown vegetation and underbrush. Goats are particularly good at this. They can graze on steep or difficult terrain that is hard for humans to manage, and they eat nearly everything. Controlled burns and grazing are important tools to prevent wildfires, 
and new technologies may also be able to help as well. Advanced tools let us study fires, revealing new information about how they behave and move. LIDAR, or Light Detection and Ranging, uses lasers to record points in space, creating three-dimensional imaging. It has recently been used to analyze and study plumes from large fires. Computer simulations can use this data to reveal more about a fire's internal conditions and how it creates its own weather, which may in turn help to better predict how fires spread. Scientists are also combining drone imaging with NASA satellite data, hoping to correlate them to one day quickly and easily survey the state and health of a forest from above. This technique could eventually be combined with other technologies, using weather and geographic data, simulations, and artificial intelligence to better predict where and when fires may be most likely to occur in a given season. Already, an AI system called FireMap is helping to predict the path of wildfires in real time, using weather data and satellite imaging of terrain, vegetation, and human development to model the movement of an active fire. Through education, combating climate change, land management, and new technologies, we hope to be able to reduce deadly wildfires in the future. And now for our research roundup. Caloric restriction, that is, reduced caloric intake without malnutrition, is one of the most reliable methods of increasing lifespan in animals. Experiments in the 1930s showed that caloric restriction increased the lifespan of rats, and work since then has found similar results in other organisms and has demonstrated other health benefits. Though results in humans remain inconclusive, work in model organisms has shown that caloric restriction can reduce the incidence of tumors, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and other disorders. Now, a team of researchers based at New York's University of Rochester has shown that mice kept on a caloric restriction diet have improved DNA repair efficiency. One of the most dangerous forms of DNA damage is a double-stranded break. The severing of both strands can lead to rearrangements or other genomic instability. Cells have several mechanisms to repair double-strand breaks, including non-homologous end joining. In this study, the researchers found that non-homologous end joining efficiency was greater in skin, lung, kidney, and brain cell cultures for mice kept on a caloric restriction diet for four weeks. There was also an increase in the expression of DNA repair-associated genes. The improvement in DNA repair is likely to lead to lower rates of cell death, mutation, and cancer incidence. The race has been on for some years now to create biomarkers that can accurately measure biological age. Having such biomarkers is critical in the development of therapies that target the aging process directly. And one of the most promising ways to measure biological age are DNA methylation clocks. These DNA methylation clocks measure the methylation status of key sites on the genome, which were chosen due to their relevance to aging, in order to give an estimate of biological age. The methylation status of these sites determines gene expression and predictably shift as we get older, making it possible to examine the genome and say with some certainty how old someone is. Now, Dr. Steve Horvath and his team have authored a new study featuring a methylation clock not for measuring the biological age of humans, but for cats. The development of methylation clocks for cats is important in the context of pet longevity research and the development of therapies that may allow our furry friends to live longer and healthier lives. Having access to accurate methylation clocks able to measure aging is critical to ascertain if a particular anti-aging drug or therapy has been successful, and that applies equally to cats and humans. Some therapies might initially reach companion animals before moving to human trials. Researchers from the University of Geneva have shown that a warm environment improves bone strength and highlights a related link with gut microbiome composition. The study showed that a warm environment of around 34 degrees Celsius, or 93 degrees Fahrenheit, appears to improve bone strength and prevents the age-related bone density loss typically seen in diseases such as osteoporosis. The researchers have shown that this is linked to changes in the populations of bacteria living in the gut microbiome. They were able to improve bone strength and density in mice suffering with osteoporosis by transplanting microbiota from mice that were kept at a warmer environmental temperature. 
Doing this also had the overall effect of slowing down the progression of the disease. It appears that the beneficial changes relating to heat come from gut bacteria that produce a metabolite known as polyamine. By transplanting these particular bacteria, which thrive in warmer environments, to the guts of mice suffering from osteoporosis in colder conditions, the researchers observed some reversal of disease progression. The researchers looked at epidemiological data relating to the incidence of osteoporosis, taking into account average temperature, latitude, calcium composition, and vitamin D levels. They discovered that there was a lower incidence of hip fractures, a common consequence of osteoporosis, for people who live in warmer regions. These findings could pave the way for the development of novel therapies to address osteoporosis. Such low-tech approaches as fecal transfers are one such possibility, as is isolating the particular bacteria in question and transferring them as a probiotic to patients with osteoporosis. A group of researchers from MIT and The Ohio State University have devised an effective anti-cancer therapy by loading cytokine coding RNA fragments into lipid nanoparticles and injecting them directly into the tumor. The researchers achieved highly promising results using artificially created self-replicating RNA fragments. This approach allows for highly targeted delivery. Tumor regression was achieved following a single injection, which is a major success in the rapidly developing field of cancer immunotherapy. And now for a news nugget. Hong Kong-based Deep Longevity is offering a new iPhone app to help keep your biological age under your chronological age. The app, called Young.ai, uses a wide array of metrics, including blood biomarkers, fitness wearable data, facial photographs of the user, and epigenetic clocks, all combined with deep learning algorithms within the app to determine biological age. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against aging. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. <laughs> <laughs>